Well, in this session, we're going to be looking at the age of industrial materialism, which lasts this time instead of 100 years or 75 years, about 60 years from 1850 to 1910. So let's get started. The age of industrial materialism is called that because it was highly industrial. It featured the growing uh, force of industry in Western Europe and in North America. Certainly the textile mills had been going before this, but not only textiles, but all sorts of factories and mills and production centers were sprouting up all over the place to provide goods and services, which of course then increased stores and all kinds of trade and commerce. It's also materialism because the focus was producing more things for people, better, better living conditions, more conveniences in the home, the kitchen, the farm, um, and just life in general, getting around from one place to another. So all of that was about a higher standard of living. So remember that in the Enlightenment, it was all about reason is going to give us what we want. The things we're craving for, the things that we think we're lacking are going to be provided by reason. Well, that didn't provide everything that people wanted, so then they tried passion and feeling and experience. That would be the romantics that we just discussed in the last session. Well, that led to darkness and and destruction if you pursue it far enough. And so then they thought, well, let's just get more good stuff. Let's just have a better life in terms of more goods and services. So that's what this is all about. So the age of industrial materialism saw the rise of modern cities, like what you see there in the Picture is London, that's Piccadilly in London, uh, just before uh, probably this period ended. And of course, the production of mass produced goods and urban services. You, to live in a city, you have to have urban services. It was a move away from the rural oriented way of life. So, this is a time in which many, many people who, for generations, their families had lived in the country, on the farms, on the big estates, were now moving into the large cities and changing their way of life from farm work or small town work to um, work in the factories and the shops and the, the industries of the larger cities. Probably the best way to look at this would be to study the British Empire very briefly, so we're going to be doing that. The British Empire grew out of its victory over Napoleon's France in 1815. Remember, the, the big enemy of Napoleon was Britain. They were never on his side. Uh, some of the German states, uh, even Austria at times, was on Napoleon's side, but Britain never was, and Britain never gave in, and they eventually triumphed over Napoleon. The British Empire had really begun under Elizabeth I. She had sent Sir Walter Raleigh out, and he had investigated the possibility or opportunities for British colonies in North America. The colony of Virginia was actually named after her, the Virgin Queen. So the colony of the Virgin Queen was Virginia. And then, of course, James I, her successor, and the, as the, the Tudors were replaced by the Stuarts, James I um, continued that colonization. Uh, the earliest colony, the earliest city was Jamestown, named after James I, the same James as the King James Bible. And then his son, Charles I, Charleston was established, Charleston, South Carolina, Charleston, um, Massachusetts as well. Though the empire had grown under these monarchs and its colonial empire had uh, expanded, it really reached its height under Queen Victoria, who reigned from 1838 to 1901, just hugely long, only now surpassed by Elizabeth II in her reign. In fact, she was so influential, Victoria was, that there's a whole term named after her that really typifies the, the whole age of that late 1800s, early 1900s, called the Victorian era. It, uh, Victorian can be used for a style of architecture. There you see a picture of a Victorian-style house, you know, two stories, high gables for the roof, um, perhaps a fenced perhaps a screened-in porch surrounding the house. Um, that's Victorian-style. Victorian-style dress, you can see, especially for women. 
the women would wear those long <clears throat> ankle length dresses, long sleeves, high necklines, maybe a bustle in the back. Men would wear maybe a swallowtail coat or at least a, a, a jacket with a long, uh, you know, a longer jacket, top hat perhaps. And then the Victorian term can also be used for being sort of prudish, not wanting to talk about sexual things, certain things off limits for discussion. That would be a Victorian attitude towards certain topics. It was said that the sun never set on the British Empire. So if we go around the globe, thinking of British colonies during the time, in Africa, there was Nigeria, which is still English-speaking in terms of its government and education. There's Kenya, or we Americans say Kenya. In East Africa, same, same thing. South Africa was uh, eventually conquered uh, at the very late part of the Victorian period. It was conquered. Uh, it was taken away from the Dutch by the British and became a British colony. And today, South Africa also speaks English, along with Afrikaans and various tribal languages. South America and the Caribbean, you had British Guiana. Um, in Northern South America, you have Belize, which is English-speaking, at least on the coast. The island of Jamaica and the Bahamas. In North America, you had Canada. I remember that the colonies had broken away by this time. The American colonies, the North American colonies, but Canada remained a British colonial possession in North America. In Asia, uh, the British had Singapore and Hong Kong, uh, what we call Greater India, the, uh, the Indian colonial possessions of Britain, which after independence divided into a number of different countries, India proper, but also Pakistan, Afghanistan, Bangladesh, and Sri Lanka all part of greater British India. In the Mediterranean, there's Gibraltar, which is just a tip of Spain, that big rock sticking out the south of Spain towards Africa, which has always been, for many years, a, a British possession. The British sort of control access to the Mediterranean at Gibraltar. And then the island of Malta, which is Italian-speaking, but also a British base in the Mediterranean. In the Pacific, Australia and New Zealand were British colonies along with some other smaller island groups. So you can see <laughs> with all the red areas that this was the British colonial empire and it really did span the globe so that the sun never did ever quite set on the British empire. Now let's talk about the Industrial Revolution. As I said, there were textile mills and other kinds of industries that had existed prior to this, but this was the time in which industry really mushroomed in size and in scope. The concept of mass production occurred during this time. We think of Henry Ford as perfecting the concept of mass production, and that would happen uh, after this period. But the beginnings of it took place during this Industrial Revolution. Uh, the mass production allowed people to move from, instead of a craftsman making a product from beginning to end, the craftsman would make only a part of the product and then pass it on to someone else who would make another part, and then finally, after a series of people had worked on it, it, it became the complete product. Newer technology and machinery were developed during this time, and I, I like to think about domestic lighting when it comes to this concept. At the beginning of this period, people, many people still lit their homes at night with candles. Candles were expensive, um, but that was the light that you had. If you wanted to do any reading or sewing or any kind of work at night, um, then, then of course you would, you know, light some candles. But then as the whaling industry kind of went down, of course you'd use whale oil as well sometimes. But then with the discovery of oil, especially in Pennsylvania, um, this byproduct of, of petroleum is called kerosene. And initially that black petroleum coming out of the ground, they didn't quite know what to do with it. So they were, they were able to process the kerosene from it, and then they just kind of disposed of the rest. Of course, now we have gasoline and other products made from it. But kerosene, and then you could use the kerosene to light kerosene lamps, which people still use today, especially if the power goes out. A lot of people will have a kerosene lamp at home so that they can use the light until the power goes back on, the electric power. And then natural gas is another byproduct of petroleum that could be used. 
and natural gas is something that you need uh, large quantities of. So pipelines were laid to bring this gas to the cities and into some people's homes, at least wealthy people's homes, and you can actually use the gas light on the streets uh, for street lights, but also in your home. And of course, this made this meant that fire was always a danger. There were a lot of fires as a result, but eventually they got to the place where they could control it. And finally, with Thomas Edison's invention of the usable light bulb, electricity was harnessed for use in lighting in homes. Of course, there was this big battle between Edison and Tesla for what kind of electric current would be used and who would have the production means and who would have the distribution means. And eventually, Edison edged Tesla out of the picture. Lately, Tesla has been coming back in a big way, although, of course, he's been long dead. But Tesla's products and Tesla's concepts remain. Innovations in agriculture included machinery that was able to harvest cotton. Instead of people picking cotton by hand and then removing the seeds by hand and, and keeping the fibers, uh, they were able to pick the cotton and then put it in a cotton gin, which would comb the fibers off the seeds and uh, allow for massive cotton production which really increased during that time. <clears throat> it was also a time for high quality hybrids, better corn, better wheat, you know, better fruit trees, um, even cattle, you know, breeding cattle, breeding uh, sheep, breeding pigs for better products. And also the, the, there was less need for manual labor. As more machinery came into use, you needed less people to run a farm. So you had to let people go. There were not jobs for people in farming anymore. So what happens? Well, thankfully, they could move to the city and get a job in the factories making the machinery that people were using. So there was a mass transfer of population from the rural areas to the cities and from rural occupations to occupations in industry. This mass movement of populations and a resulting decline in rural living and an uptick in the populations of the cities uh, led to something called urbanization, um, the need for a whole new level of city services and city life. In Europe and North America, rural people moved to urban areas to find work. And so you, again, as I mentioned, you know, large numbers of people over this time left the farm, left country life, and moved into the cities. In the United States, along with people moving from country to city, you had the Civil War, which we'll talk about in a bit, in which the whole population of black slaves, African-American slaves, were freed in the South and in the border states, which led to a whole upheaval in terms of, okay, where do these people go? They're not slaves anymore, but there's got to be a place for them in society. There were even some schemes of resettling African-Americans back in Africa, and a number of places were established to do that. In um, the British colonies, there was a place called Sierra Leone in which uh, British slaves who wanted to be uh, set free and go back to Africa were resettled in Sierra Leone. In uh, the United States, there was another movement called um, uh, the abolitionist movement tried to establish a colony in Africa called Liberia in which many freed American slaves were, well, they were freed and they went back to Liberia. So. That, but obviously, you're not going to do that with millions of people. So, these freed African Americans needed to find a place in society, and many of them also moved into the city, although some took up work in the rural areas as well. And then in the United States and Canada, there were new waves of immigration that flooded into North America. So, instead of the Germans and the Irish as it had been, and, and the English before them and the Scots Irish. Now we have Eastern and Southern Europeans coming to the Americas, Italians and Poles, uh, some Russians, Jewish people, so on, uh, coming into America during this time. Urbanization is the term that describes a process in which people left the old rural ways and migrated to the larger cities. The mass migrations to the cities obviously created a huge need for goods and services for the expanding, exploding populations. And there you see uh, a city during this period. I mean, it's not pretty. Uh, they're full of high rises. People are living in those high rises with shops below. The streets are crowded because a lot of commerce is done on the streets. Uh, 
Um, and so it, it's just, it kind of presented a problem because it could be such a mess. Large numbers of people gathered in places like that could be very unhealthy because of the sewage and lack of uh, trash services, uh, not good water, all those kinds of things. So there was a need to develop city services. So this kind of urban infrastructure that needed to, to be developed included hardened roads. I mean, you're not going to have dirt roads in the city because when it rains, it's going to be absolutely filthy. And uh, wagons are going to get stuck in the roads. Um, you know, horses are going to be needed to, to you know, pull these carts through the roads and they're, they're going to put them someplace. So you need hardened roads, either cobblestones, bricks, or a new concoction called asphalt. In the early days, they called it McAdamizing roads because of McAdam, who invented the, the solution. It's gravel, sand, and tar. And so they called it McAdamizing, but now we call it asphalt. Public transportation, not everybody had a horse. Where would you put all the horses? Um, not everybody could walk to their job because it was too far away. So you had to have public transportation, which would be horse-pulled trolleys in the beginning, and then later, of course, electric and um, gas uh, buses. Sewer services are pretty obvious. You've got to have a way to take all that sewage and get dispose of it. Utilities like water had to be available, fresh water for people, clean water for people. And what are you going to do with all the kids? There's an element that we don't talk about when it comes to education. And of course, in the United States, public education was way ahead of pretty much any place else in the world in the early days because Americans believed in teaching children at least the basics of reading, writing, and arithmetic. And of course, the reading part was also, you know, so that they could read the Bible because America was a very Christian country in the very beginning. Um, and so that was one motivation. But Another motivation for starting schools wasn't as much about the kids learning as it was about what to do with the kids when the parents were at work in the factories. You've got to do something with the children. So in addition to educating them, there had to be a way of keeping them occupied and supervised while parents were at work. So schools began to spring up throughout the large cities. Housing, you've got to put people someplace. And so instead of building little houses on the ground, you run out of space pretty quick, so you've got to build people up into four, five, six-story apartment buildings, maybe even taller sometimes. Where are they going to get their food and clothing and other necessities? Well, you've got to have look stores in, in, the, in an area where people can get to them easily. So neighborhood stores, small stores run by people, but also larger stores that people could get to as well. And then medical facilities, how are you going to treat people? There needs to be doctors and nurses and clinics and so forth. So all of that had to be dealt with. The result of all of this development was the new industrial city, something that did not exist in the 1700s. I mean, you did have a large city in London. You had New York City. You had Boston. You had Paris, of course. But um, those cities were not the same. Uh, as what developed during this industrial material period. These cities were on a far different scale. And so you had the, the cities in the old world, but in addition you had now Chicago, you had Cincinnati, um, Baltimore, some of the larger cities on the East Coast uh, in, in, the, in the United States and, and in Canada. You had Toronto and other places like that, Quebec. Along with urbanization, as I mentioned, the old rural ways of life are left behind, but also the customs that that rural people observe. You know, certain seasons you do certain things, uh, you, you do things certain ways. Uh, skills like you know how to how to butcher an animal that you raised on the farm that disappeared when people went to the city. They didn't butcher their own animals. They didn't raise their own vegetables. A religion. People changed religion or, or dropped religion when they went to the city. Why? Because there was not that community that they were part of that was part of a certain religious group. So they oftentimes abandoned religion or they changed from one kind of practice to another. And so religion changed, worldview changed, um, much more of a city worldview than a rural worldview. And you can even see that today. There's a real difference in the way people think between people who are very much city dwellers, very much with a city mindset, 
and those in the country who have a, kind of a different way of looking at things. City dwellers adopted an increasingly humanistic mindset. It's all about people and what's good for people and what's f fair for people and so on, and much less about God and, and much more, I guess you'd say, supernatural or thinking in terms of the bigger picture of what life is all about. Much different belief between city and rural dwellers. And this urbanization brought with it a new belief that science, industry, and technology will answer most, if not all, human problems. So just, just give us enough time and we'll develop the products, we'll develop the science, we'll develop the technology, and it will, it will fix everything. And of course, we found in the later 20th century that that isn't entirely true. Now let's talk about the American Civil War because it certainly changed our country. Our country moved increasingly from rural to urban after this war was over. What led to the Civil War? Well, of course, it was about slavery, and that's clear. I think most people would understand that. That's how the Civil War is usually framed to uh, most of us in school. But there were other questions as well. In other words, what kind of country are we? Are we going to be a country that's dominated by the northern viewpoint, that's industrial, that's um, about admitting new immigrants, that's about um, scientific progress and all of that? Or are we going to be a country that is more rural oriented? Or are we going to be two countries? That was a, a big issue. And which of the cultural viewpoints will guide us into the future best? And then, of course, what should be done about slavery? Because some states in the United States had slaves. It was legal. Those were mostly in the South. But also some that we wouldn't really consider South, like maybe Maryland, um, Delaware. Kentucky, Missouri, uh, those were slave states, but they weren't exactly South. And so um, some, some states were very opposed to slavery, like those in the Northeast, like Massachusetts, Connecticut, so forth. So the conflict grew between the Northern and the Southern viewpoints in the United States. Eventually it led to a split with the election of Abraham Lincoln. Uh, Lincoln only won because the, the Democrats split their votes with two different candidates, a Southern candidate and a Northern candidate. And because the, the Democrat vote was split, Lincoln was elected. And uh, immediately, some of the Southern states, because, because the Republican Party was brand new, I think there had only been one candidate before Lincoln. I think his name was John C. Fremont, Californian, by the way, who'd, ran on, who'd run on the Republican ticket. So Lincoln was in this fairly new Republican Party, and the Republican Party was very much against slavery, very much against slavery. Democrat Party was split north and south. Southern Democrats very pro-slavery, Northern Democrats kind of not sure about it. So when Lincoln was elected um, in 1860, then the Southern states began to hold conventions, and many of them began to vote to leave the United States, starting with South Carolina, but eventually... 13 of the states uh, formed a confederation called the Confederate States in which they left the Union and tried to form uh, a new country. You can see this is how it divided up with uh, the slave states being in gray, although the red line marks the Confederacy. So some of the slave states never left the Union. Missouri, Kentucky, uh, at at this point, Virginia and West Virginia were one state, but once Virginia left the Union, the western part of the state voted to stay in, and so they formed their separate state, West Virginia. Delaware and Maryland also stayed in the Union, but were slave states. The rest of the country was not slave-oriented. Um, the new state of Kansas, fairly new state of Kansas, had been a terrible bloody ground, a battleground between pro-slave people and anti-slave people uh, as to what kind of a state it was going to be. It was kind of a mini civil war in Kansas. It ended up being a non-slave state, but a lot of people were killed over the issue of slavery when it was forming as a state. The results of the American Civil War, which lasted from 1861 to 1865, were that 600,000 Americans lost their lives. And we're counting both sides, you know, both, of, both sides being Americans, um, some fighting for the Confederacy, some fighting for the Union. But that's a lot, and, and I don't think that that number has been surpassed in any war that we fought since then, including um, World War II. Plus, many, many more injured, maimed, you know, psychologically damaged 
in terms of what they suffered. And you can see here some dead on the battlefields. I believe the left is Antietam. The right may be Gettysburg. Uh, but um, just, just a terrible toll taken. The northern economy and way of life were triumphant. So eventually, after four long years of war and devastation, finally the north triumphed and the south was forced to rejoin the Union, which they did, some of them very reluctantly. And even today, the animosity remains from the descendants of the North and the South. Sometimes, it's not, it's not horrible, but sometimes it remains. The results of the American Civil War included the fact that the Southern way of life was changed radically. It didn't change overnight. It was still fairly agricultural. It was much less industrial than the North. But industry began to really come into the South. Um, slavery was ended, so they had to figure out what to do with the former slaves. And that did not work out very peacefully much of the time. Um, eventually, there was sort of a settlement, but a lot of the slaves moved north. But in the north, they weren't particularly well received either because they would take the low-end jobs away from the whites who had had them. And that didn't create a lot of um, harmony. Uh, it wasn't the slaves' fault. It's just one of those things that when you've got a massive change, people don't always adjust very well to it. And I'm not excusing anybody. I'm just saying that's the way it was. And then, of course, there are still remains of, of sectional enmity, enmity or, or dislike between Northerners and Southerners sometimes. Northerners oftentimes consider Southerners kind of slow and backward. And Southerners consider the Northerners brash and rude, I guess you'd say. But... The big picture was that the United States was once again united and it was now harnessed for a world role, which before that it was not. We were, we were not on the same playing field. We were not in the same league as some of the larger European nations. And suddenly we are, we are playing in the big leagues. I think I've mentioned this before, but until the 1870s, until after the American Civil War was over, Two nations in Europe that we take for granted now as being long-standing European nations, they didn't really exist as nations before this period. So in the 1870s, both Germany and Italy achieved united nationhood. And before that, Italy was, I mean, the people were Italian-speaking, Italian culture, but they weren't a united nation. They were a bunch of little areas and dominions that eventually were united. Uh, Italy united under Garibaldi um, and placed Victor Emmanuel II as king of Italy. It was a, he, was a, he was an imported king. They just got this royal person and made him king of Italy. And then during the 1870s, also Germany. Germany had existed as Prussia, as Bavaria, as Westphalia, the Rhineland states, and so on. Brandenburg, all those, all those different areas, eventually over the years had united. And then finally, in 1870, Otto von Bismarck united them into a united Germany. All of them German-speaking, but if you, if you talk to the Germans, they'll say that there are very big accent differences and vocabulary differences in the different regions of Germany even today, just like we have in the United States. So there's Otto von Bismarck. I always wondered, what's the purpose of a little spike on top of the helmet? I, I never quite got that. So in 1871, Bismarck achieved the unification of all the German states except Austria. Austria had its own empire. They were not interested in being absorbed into Germany. Uh, Austria was German-speaking, but it was never absorbed into the German empire until Hitler did it in just before World War II. Immediately, Germany flexed its muscles and took up an old grievance with France over some disputed territory called the provinces of Alsace and Lorraine. And uh, Germany, in a very quick war, uh, overcame France and annexed Alsace and Lorraine into the German Empire. Um, they were led by the, the dominant northern region of Germany called Prussia. Also, this happened during the time of German unification. But... The Franco-Prussian War was won by Germany, and but it, the French never forgot it, you know. So it led to a series of conflicts, which started with the Franco-Prussian War, but then World War I was next, and World War II came after that. Kind of the same, some of the same dynamics going on between uh, at least the, the Germans and the French. Of course, the British and others were involved in some of the later conflicts as well. 
Tsarist Russia, Tsar, the Tsar was the king or emperor of Russia. Russia in the beginning of this period was a colonial power. It had annexed a lot of the Siberian areas and some of the Central Asian areas were under its influence, but it also had colonies in Alaska, which under Lincoln's administration, the United States purchased these uh, Russian colonies in Alaska. Um, it was called Seward's Folly. Nobody thought that it would be worth anything, and now, of course, it's a huge source of oil and other natural resources. Russia was very slow to modernize. It was very slow to admit people out of the lower classes, whereas in Europe there were some revolutions that kind of forced the nobility to allow some of the people to become more prosperous, uh, to become educated, become voters. In Russia, that was just clamped down on while the Western European countries were adjusting to all of that. And so uh, when revolution came in Russia, it was violent. Uh, there was a growing unrest among workers and peasants who had been suppressed for a long time uh, versus their counterparts in Western Europe, which had gotten some freedom. Tsar Nicholas I was uh, pretty tyrannical. You can see the difference between him and some of the peasants in Russia. But uh, the Russian Revolution was huge in 1917. Before the Civil War, there was U.S. territorial expansion, but it, and, but it continued on. The conquest of territory from Mexico happened in 1846 and 47, when the United States and Mexico were disputing over lands in what became Texas, New Mexico, and Arizona, and all in California, as a matter of fact. So um, the Mexican War, um, I guess, resolved that, at least to the United States' satisfaction, probably not to Mexico's satisfaction. Alaska was purchased from Russia, as I said, um, and then, of course, the United States put out something they called the Monroe Doctrine, in which they told the European countries, stay out of Central America. Central America is our sphere of influence, so don't, don't get involved in Panama or Guatemala or Costa Rica or any of those places. This is our sphere of influence. So in a, they didn't become colonies, but they sort of came under United States orbit. So you can see um, uh, United States territorial expansion over the years in different sections until finally it has the lands that we know of the United States today. The United States also built the Panama Canal and owned it until we turned it back over to Panama. I'm not, I'm not sure. I think it was 30 or 40 years ago. Uh, the United States won colonies in Puerto Rico from Spain with the very brief Spanish-American War, and I think it was 1898 and 99, um, and then did not take over the Philippines, but acquired Philippines as sort of a colony, but more of a protectorate from Spain. So Spain lost the Philippines, lost Puerto Rico, lost Cuba. Um, Cuba became an independent country under the American sphere of influence. Puerto Rico became a territory and the Philippines were also under American influence. Eventually, of course, Cuba broke away and became communist. And then Hawaii was basically taken over by U.S. Marines and um, the king or queen of Hawaii was welcomed into the United States. It just was one of those things that was kind of bloodless, but um, not much the Hawaiians could do about it. We talked about George Hegel uh, in a previous lecture, but he believed that the universe is not driven by a personal God, but by an impersonal principle of progress. Remember, it was thesis conflicting with its opposite antithesis and produced something new called synthesis. And of course, this became the driving idea behind evolution, behind communism, uh, behind so many different social movements and um, ideas, Hegel provided the non-God-oriented mechanism that it could explain why things change and sometimes change for the better, or at least the more beneficial. So Darwin took it and took the idea and used it to explain how the variety of life and adaptations to the surroundings could happen. Freud used it in psychology, Marx used it in Marxist and communist political theory. Okay, now for the art as an expression of all of these things. Something happened now called realism. Um, we've talked about realism and idealism before, but now realism takes on a whole new form in the sense that we now have photography. The earliest photographs that you can find and search them out on YouTube or the internet. The earliest photographs are from the late 1830s. They're not very good. They're not very clear. 
but they're experimenting with them. By the time you get to the 1840s, they're better. And on into the Civil War, you get some very sharp pictures sometimes. Um, you couldn't move. You know, you had to sit there or stand there still for a long time, you know, maybe 30 or 40 seconds. But still, um, it produced some decent pictures. And now you, what you see is what you get. I mean, it's not an artist's interpretation. It's what's really there. The camera captures it. The old opera has its final hurrah during this period. The Verdi operas, La, La Traviata, Rigoletto, the Wagner, I guess you'd say German versions of the opera with the great German epic, legendary uh, ring cycle, the Ring des Nibelungen, uh, and some of the others that celebrate at least the Germanic or European legendary past. And of course, Hitler was a big fan of Wagner, and so was Nietzsche. Artistic expression and also involved into the Art Nouveau of the French, the new art. Um, you know, just very delicate, almost fanciful types of depictions. Here you see, I guess you'd see fairies on the left. And then this jewelry, um, Art Nouveau. And of course, Tiffany is a, uh, tif the Tiffany glass is a expression of Art Nouveau as well. But just things that are just pretty and very, very unique. You can't study this period in art without talking about Impressionism. The French Impressionists have made their huge mark in the art world. Um, some of the young artists during this period, it was very, very difficult to get into the French Academy of Art, to get anything, you know, advertised or accepted in terms of their artwork. Remember, the French from Louis XIV onward have been very strict about what is publicly acknowledged and what is not. And so instead of fighting the system, they just broke away and formed their own little group. And they displayed their own art in their own galleries, apart from the French Academy. And one of the Academy people went to see this alternate, you know, presentation of art. And uh, he saw this particular painting by Claude Monet that was called Impression Sunrise. And so somehow that member of the French Academy just called them all Impressionistes. And so that became the term for their kind of art. It's not clear. It's not, you know, sometimes it's hard to make out what they're, what they're painting because it's kind of vague. But this is a pretty good idea of what they're doing because it's called Impression Sunrise. It's just an impression of sunrise. It's not supposed to be a, a clear picture of a sunrise. It's supposed to be Monet's impression of kind of his idea of a sunrise. So Monet is one of the great early Impressionists. My favorite, I think, is Renoir. Renoir is a little more, I guess you'd say, realistic. But even there, it's a little cartoonish, if, if I can use that word. It's not quite realistic. It's a little bit, there's a little bit of idealism mixed in it. This is actually a boating party. A group of, of people that got together, Renoir's friends, were on this boat on the river. And they're having a wonderful time, and this is what they experienced during the 1870s, 1880s, sometime in there. Many other Impressionists. You have Degas, who, who focused on the ballet. And of course, this is not a substitute for reading your textbook. I can't go into all the details. Your textbook gives far more examples of Impressionist art, but Degas focused on the, um, the, the, the movement of the ball ballet dancers, you had others that um, were involved as well in this Impressionist movement. But Van Gogh is not really an Impressionist. We call him a post-Impressionist because he goes beyond just the Impressions and deals with kind of what's going on in his own mind. Some say that Van Gogh was autistic, somewhere on the autistic spectrum. I don't doubt the possibility of that. Of course, it's hard to know now. Uh, he's been dead for a long time, but um, he seems to have been that sort of person. He was very difficult socially, didn't seem to be able to quite m merge in with the social interactions of people. He tended to take things quite literally. Uh, his brother was a, a Dutch um, Reformed pastor, and um, Van Gogh, at least in his early life, was very religious. He attended a, a lecture or a sermon in which, you know, they're talking about what Jesus said on the Sermon on the Mount, in which Jesus said, well, if you if you have two cloaks, sell one and, and give the money to the poor, you know, give your extra stuff away to the poor. 
And of course, Christianity has always balanced some of what Jesus said with some other things that the Bible says about, you know, taking care of your family and so forth. But Van Gogh took it all very literally. So he went and basically gave away most of his possessions. So he had no place to live and no place to, you know, very few things to live on. So his brother had to go bail him out. And uh, his brother kind of was his caretaker, but Van Gogh was difficult to deal with. He had a friend, artist, Cezanne, um, and Cezanne was one of the few, I guess, that could tolerate him. At this point, Van Gogh was living in Arles in southern France, and he was painting. In fact, one of the oldest people in the world died. Oh, I think she died. She was a French woman. She died about maybe 25 or 30 years ago. She died in the late 1900s. And um, she was 127 when she died. And she said that her father owned a shop that artists used to come to to buy their paints and brushes and supplies. And she remembers a very eccentric, red-haired Dutchman coming in to buy his paints. And that was Vincent Van Gogh. So that was really interesting. Within the lifetime of some of us, <laughs> there was somebody who actually had known of him or had seen him. But notice the swirls in this painting. You know, autistic people sometimes see things differently than than others do. And so there's a theory that, you know, this these swirls in the sky are what Van Gogh actually saw, and that perhaps that is evidence that he was autistic. He ended up um, shooting himself, killing himself with a gunshot to the head. Um, it's just because life seemed so hard. He he and Cezanne had gonna you know were gonna be roommates. They were gonna be living together, and then very early on in that relationship, Van Gogh had attacked Cezanne with a knife, and uh, just you know like Cezanne finally said, "I just can't I, I can't live with you. I can't I can't manage you." He also uh, Van Gogh was interested in a, a particular woman, and uh, he had cut his ear off as a. I guess a sign. I know there's a lot of legend attached to this, but apparently he had sent this woman his severed ear as a as a sign of his affection, which, you know, normal people don't do that sort of. So the end of industrial materialism, the last decade of the 19th century and the first decade of the 20th century were, in many ways, the last days of the old world. The old order was quickly passing away. For the upper and middle classes, these years of industrial materialism brought renewed material prosperity, you know, better lifestyle, and a growing faith in progress that things would get better and better. People could pursue life with confidence that the future would be very bright for them and their descendants. But that confidence would be shattered very shortly by the horrors of World War. So really, after 1910, things began to change. Uh, there were rumors of war and threats of war after 1910. A number of times the world almost went to war. It finally did in 1914. And we'll talk about that in the modern period.